What's going on, guys? Tyler Santiago here. Santiago Show, episode number nine. We have a special guest today, Mark Feinstein. Now, uh, I've known Mark for a little bit now. He used to come to the old shop. Didn't really know who he was at first. And he goes, oh, I, uh, I, write, for, I write for the MLB. I was like, Feinstein. I'm like, I know that name. I'm like, shit. <laughs> Next day, I'm watching MLB Network at the shop, and I see him. I'm like, that's the guy. That's the guy. There you go. So, Mark, tell me a little bit about uh, about what you do and, and what you're up to these days. So, I covered the Yankees for 16 years for MLB.com for nice. six years, and then for the New York Daily News for 10. I went back to MLB.com at the beginning of 2017 to be executive reporter, nice. kind of a national writer, cover the whole league, a lot of uh, you know transactional type stuff, roster analysis. Uh, trade deadline, free agency, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's uh, for 16 years I was very laser focused on one team, and now I got 30 of them to worry about. So, what was that transition like going from Yankees every day, all day to everywhere? It was difficult at first because I knew everybody at the Yankees, and I knew anybody at the other teams mm-hmm. except for those who I had crossed paths with in New York. Uh, so, getting to know people at every team took a little while, but. Uh, uh, I got there eventually, and you know the, the national writers in the baseball world, Jeff Passan, Ken Rosenthal, uh, big guns. You know, the, the big guys. These are the guys I compete with, and you know happen to be great guys and good friends of mine. But we're competitors, and we try to get each other. So uh, it's uh, it's a very challenging job, but one I enjoy very much. So you say that you know guys like you, Rosenthal, Passan, are competitors, good friends. But what exactly are you competing for? Like what happens when you're the guy who has the breaking story on, you know. Aaron Judge broke his ankle. Like, what happens then? Well, you know, the more news you can break, the more credibility you have, especially when you're breaking news that's accurate and yeah. not just throwing mm-hmm. crap against the wall. Um, you know, it just helps your credibility. It helps get your name out there. helps more people in the game know who you are. Uh, you talk to more people. I mean, the breaking news aspect of it in this uh, media environment you break a story, it's yours for about three minutes, and then everybody <laughs> else confirms it. Yep. Everybody else has it on Twitter and. You know, I mean, people always say nobody cares who breaks the story. Just tell us what's happening. Well, that's what we're trying to do. And we're trying to be the first one to tell you what's happening. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's nice when you can get one. When you can't get one, you tip your cap to your competitors and you keep trying to get the next one. So you just mentioned, uh, like, breaking news now. Three minutes, the story's out. Everybody's talking about it. What was it like, you know, you started out, so you're 16 years. When did you start out with the Yankees? 2001 was my first So 2001 compared to 2022. I mean way different now so tell me a little bit about how it was breaking a story then compared to today i would say the biggest difference and the thing that has transformed the whole news industry is twitter and social media uh before twitter i want to say it was like 08 maybe 09 when twitter really took off and became a a, a cultural phenomenon you know when i worked at the daily news the first few years you could break a story in the paper uh or even maybe on your website and you had it for a while, right? If you broke something in the paper, yeah. people woke up, read the paper, and said, oh, wow, I can't believe that happened. That was still rare because the website was still a factor um, you know, back in the early 2000s. But it wasn't as immediate mm-hmm. as Twitter is now. So um, that aspect of it certainly has changed things. And the fact that, uh, that everything is now 24-7, there's really no off time, right? I could be off, and if... Something happens, Something happens yeah. I'm on. So I think that's been the biggest difference for sure. So uh, I know you said in the beginning, 16 years with the Yankees. Uh, some people, I recognize you because I saw you on TV. I've seen your name a million times on Twitter. You're at like 170K followers. I mean, I'm a Tigers fan. We talked about that before. I would see your name breaking, like, you know, Justin Verlander got traded or we hired Al Vila seven years ago. I hate that guy. <laughs> but uh, stuff like that, like, you guys, you never know. And you see the name, you recognize the name. This is a guy right here. Okay, you know, so an- there's somewhere There's a real else. person behind each one yeah, of those right? Twitter accounts. Right? We're not just anonymous eggs. That's crazy. <laughs> but, but what I also want to ask you is, so 16 years with the Yankees on Twitter, all that good stuff. Another place that people will recognize you from is if they watch the Jeter documentary. So uh, tell us a little bit about your appearances on on there. So I covered Derek for the final 14 years of his career, 2001 to 2014. So 14 out of 20, basically. Uh, Of course, I missed the first four championships. I started the year after their fourth. So you got one in there. Uh, But I did get one in there. I wrote a book about that one, Mission 27, about the 2009 Yankees. Check it out. Anywhere books are sold. Um, (laughs) So I got to know Derek as well as a reporter could get to know Derek. You know, he, as you 
saw in the documentary. He kept the media at arm's length and never really let them in. Um, but when you're on the beat, you're there from the first day of spring training till the last day of the postseason. I would cover probably 130 games a year, the entire spring training, the entire postseason. So you spend a lot of hours in the clubhouse, and you get to know guys a little bit. You start, mm -hmm. you know, he and I would always chat about college football. We'd chat about American Idol. I mean, little things like that. that <laughs> nice. uh, he was a huge American Idol fan. Sanjaya fan? Huge. Or? <laughs> All right. <laughs> William Hung. <laughs> William um, Hung. So, you know, I got to know him pretty well. So when this documentary started up, um, the director and producer, Randy Wilkins, reached out to me and asked if I would come in for an interview. Of course, I said yes. Was, nice. You know, nice project. Something you certainly want to be associated with. Uh, so I went in there last summer. I think it was in July of 2021. Uh, did about a four-hour interview. Wow. And I, when we were done, I said, Randy, four-hour interview. I better make the cut. Because <laughs> if I came in here for four hours, I don't even get in there. He said, don't worry. You're going to be in there. Uh, so, yeah, I had no idea what they were going to use, what they weren't going to use. Um, it, was, it was interesting to watch it. Mm -hmm. I think for people who weren't in my position around him every day and living that journey I thought they learned a lot about him I thought there was a lot in there that was really interesting now there I wasn't agree. a whole lot yeah. that I didn't know but but there were some things that he talked about that I thought were interesting that we never talked mm -hmm. to him about or that he would never open up about yeah. you never open up about his relationship with Alex Rodriguez you know a lot of the the racism stuff and and growing up as a biracial kid uh you know that stuff he never really wanted to get into mm -hmm. he was so laser focused on winning and on the game and on his performance and he just didn't have time or the desire to get into the rest of it so i thought it was a great documentary i really enjoyed it and of course uh you know it was nice to be involved yeah, i didn't get to finish it i think i made it to the fifth episode which which you're in and i made it there i still got what six episodes seven two more seven so i gotta watch i think two and a half episodes i'm somewhere uh, on the fifth but saw you pop up that was really dope and as we talked about before um you know I'm not the biggest Yankee fan. I hate the Yankees. One thing I always say about Jeter, and I say it on social media, I have no problem saying it. I personally think Jeter's one of the most overrated players of all time. He's a good player. I, I agree. You know, he won a lot of championships, but I think you can make the argument that he wasn't the best player on his team at any time, really. He was the heart and soul, no doubt. But that that's just my argument there. Um, on top of that, but after seeing the documentary, like you said, you find out a lot of things. I had a newfound, and not that I didn't respect Derek Jeter. Sure. Obviously, I think he's a good player. But I found a newfound respect for him out of the fact that, like, man, he was really answering these questions and some of the shit he was going through during his career. And I, one thing that I admire the most about him is is I don't give a fuck attitude. And I asked him, because you saw I went to the Jeter event, and if you're like, oh, why are you going there? You're going to suck up to his face. I'm like, first of all, Derek Jeter's not going to care if I tell him he's overrated <laughs> to his face. He'd be like, all right, great. I there, got there were people with newspaper columns that he didn't care if they thought he was over yeah, either. Yeah, he could care less what I think. You know, that, that's what I mean. Like, it doesn't do anything for him. doesn't do anything for me. But one thing I asked him, like, Jeter, I grew up hating the Yankees. I literally said, I, I'm not a Yankees fan. I grew up disliking the Yankees. And he goes, well, he goes, cut me off. He goes, who do you like? I'm like, the Tigers. He goes, well, I feel bad for you there. <laughs> and he, that's a guy from Michigan, hey, too. Hey, at least you didn't say the Marlins, right? Oh, yeah. Oof, man. But uh, I asked him, like, so... What is it like, you know, the position that you were in, position of, you know, somewhat power, like everybody's looking up to you, looking to you for answers, and people are talking shit about you, people are saying negative things, like, how did you get through that just not caring? He goes, I was focused on winning. He goes, I only cared about winning and doing stuff on the field. He goes, obviously, I would hear things here and there that would bother me a little bit, but he goes, at the end of the day, if I was winning and I was doing my job, that's all that he really cared about. That's it. And he would say that back then, and you'd say, this is such a line. Like he said, it really, But it's really true. And, it's so and true. He was so consistent with it for two decades. Yep. From the time he was 21 years old, he was saying the same thing. And uh, I don't fall into the, I think, Jeter's overrated category, but I think part of that is that I got to watch him every day. Mm -hmm. And you see the little things that he does, and you see the impact he has on the team on the field and off the field. I mean, the flip play... No other shortstop makes that play, right? I mean, he's in a place where most people are like, what's he even doing over mm -hmm. there? It was luck. But then you watch. They practice that in spring training. That ball down the right field line, the shortstop has nothing to do on that play. He veers over towards the line in case the throw goes bad. And when it did, he made the perfect play. 
guy's got 3,500 hits. You can't get 3,500 hits by accident, right? Uh, now, did he benefit from being on really good teams with really good players? Absolutely. Um, but he was a big piece of that. It wasn't mm -hmm. like he was riding the coattails of other yeah. people on that team. Uh, you know, I thought he was a good shortstop. Towards Not, the end of his career, he shouldn't have been at short. That's probably true. Um, towards the end of the career, the range was not there. But I will tell you that the year 2003, so we're talking basically right in the middle of his career, when he separated his shoulder on opening day, and the Yankees we brought up about this. Eric yeah. Almonte to be the shortstop. Guy had great range, could make these diving plays when Eduardo Nunez would step in for him. Eduardo. Guy could make great diving plays, great range. Then they'd throw the ball into the third row. Jeter was the most sure-handed shortstop I've seen in a long time. If it's the ninth inning in a one-run game, you want the ball hit to him. Mm -hmm. You don't want him to have to make a diving play because chances are that ball's going to get through. But if the ball's hit to him, he's going to make that throw. He's not going to bulk under the pressure, and I think there are a lot of shortstops that do, and so I think you have to give him some credit for always sort of being consistent. that steady hand, that consistent hand that nothing bothered him. No spot was too big for him. And obviously he came through with some really big moments in the postseason. I, I think first ballot Hall of Fame was guaranteed and, and completely worthwhile. Oh, that I don't I don't like disquestion that at all. I, I agree. He should have been first ballot, no doubt. His stats are there. But do you think numbers can be deceiving a little bit? So defensively, he's the worst defensive player of all time by like a wide margin in, in terms of defensive war and all those metrics. Yeah, I'm not a defensive metric guy yeah. in general because, again, if you watch the game, mm -hmm. you can't see. can't teach instincts. You can't teach instincts. You can't teach um, the ability to slow that heartbeat down to the point where it doesn't matter how loud the stadium is, how tense the situation is, he wasn't bothered by it. And we've seen a lot of guys who are bothered by that. So uh, the defensive metrics that were around, there are some new ones out now since he retired. I would have been interested to see what some of the outs above average and things like that said about his career back then. But, uh, you know, UZR and, and some of these other stats. Defensive runs. They through. would tell you, you'd look at the leaderboards at the end of the year and be like, wait, this guy's a negative? That's not possible. Mm -hmm. You want to tell me he's not the best? That's fine. But there was no way that you could look at those years in the middle of his career. Forget 12, 13. Yeah. After he broke his ankle in 12, he wasn't as quick. He didn't have that quick first step anymore. Uh, but you look at the beginning and the middle of his career, there's no way you could tell me he was a negative on defense. You want to tell mm -hmm. me he was average? I'll be okay with that. But, okay. but the idea that he was a negative on defense, uh, that never sat well with me. I, I see your point there. Um, another thing that he was asked there, and people say it all the time, <laughs> he brought it up and he goes, yeah, well, people say if I was in Kansas City or something, you know, I wouldn't be doing this. He goes, it doesn't matter. I was here. It was like that. But he did also kind of agree to the point where, like, if he was, say, in Kansas City putting up those numbers, he probably wouldn't put it up those numbers out there. And oh, the one thing that people – I see all the time that I don't really say in, in my argument there is he was hitting, you know, bounced some of the best hitters in baseball. Who are you going to pitch to, Jeter or A-Rod? Who are you going to pitch to, Jeter, Paul O'Neill, Jeter, Matsui? You know, guys like that, you're probably going to want to pitch to the guy that is least likely to take you out of the yard, but he's going to put it in play. So it's, it's fair to say that he benefited from, like you said, oh, like, like from those guys. Uh, he, he benefited from hitting in front of those guys. He won rings because he was on great teams with great players. I mean, he couldn't, you know, without Mariano Rivera or David Cohn or Andy Pettit or Roger Clemens, he wasn't winning those rings because he didn't throw the ball. Um, nobody wins multiple rings by themselves, right? <laughs> Otherwise, Mike Trout would have a couple rings. Shohei Otani would have a couple rings. Yeah. Uh, you know, <coughs> Albert Pujols has a couple of rings, but that's because he played on some great teams with some great players. Well, the, that 06 team is probably one of the worst World that, Series that's teams true. ever. I would agree with that. Beat would they, they beat in the World Series? I Tigers. Yep. You know, I, look, sometimes, look, the, the 2000 Yankees were not a great team. No, that, they lived into the yeah. playoffs, the 87, 88 wins. They had a lot of those same guys, but they weren't playing well. They went on and won the World Series, but you can't look – like, you look at the 2000 Yankees and you look at the 98 Yankees, most of the names are the same, yeah. right? Except for, like, going from Wells to Clemens and bringing in one or two guys here or there, the bulk of that team was the same, and yet mm -hmm. the 2000 team wasn't anywhere close to the 98 team. That's the nature of the game. Um, so, yeah, if Jeter was playing in Kansas City and had 
some randos hitting behind him. Mike Sweeney. And... I, I think he would still have 3,000 hits. I think there's still a good chance because he was that good of a hitter. Um, would he have the championships? Probably not. Uh, but we've seen guys from small market teams get 3,000 hits and make the Hall of Fame. Well, I think he would have had an excellent career. Would he be Derek Jeter? No. But part of that is playing in New York, yeah. which is why part of me thinks with Aaron Judge, he's not leaving. I, I we'll just, talk about that. All right, oh, we'll boy. get there. We'll get there. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. But another thing that I like to say is I can, there's a lot of comparable people to Jeter stat-wise and, and you know tang, intangibles-wise. I'm looking at some of my Tigers guys like Alan, Alan Trammell, won a ring. Definitely was the best player on his team at one point. I don't know if he won an MVP. I think he was close to it. Trammell, I don't think ever did. Uh, Whitaker, another guy who played second. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about guys that are with one franchise, 15 to 18 years, won a ring, had the stats, the hits, and everything. Take Lou Whitaker, put him in New York for 15 years, puts up those numbers. You're talking about one of the second base, best second basemen ever, probably a first, second ballot Hall of Famer. Can't even get in, isn't that? Isn't that? What kind of, is? Do you think there's some truth to something like that? Well, I think there might be some. I think the other thing is I don't know Whitaker's overall stats off the top of my 20, head. Twenty, I believe, twenty four hundred hits, couple okay, hundred so, home runs, Gold Gloves. So twenty four hundred hits, couple hundred home runs. Those are not numbers that stand out and say that guy's in the Hall of Fame. But if he's a Yankee, twenty four hundred hit there. But Bernie Williams didn't sniff the Hall of Fame. Bernie Williams won four rings as the cleanup hitter. There had well over two thousand hits. Had probably 300, 350 home runs, and, oh, no, Bernie had less than that. He had like 250 home runs. Still, right, huge piece of those World Series championships. Won some gold gloves, even though he probably didn't really deserve them. Uh, Bernie was – Bernie's athleticism made up for his – Joe Torre used to say that Bernie lacked instincts, but his athleticism made up for it. Bernie was a really good center fielder, but you'd see him make a play once in a while, and he didn't have a great arm. Um, but Bernie put up really good numbers – and, and couldn't sniff the Hall of Fame, right? So, you know, Don Mattingly never won a ring. I know he injury obviously cost him. He was on those bad the teams. The second though. half of his career, he was on bad. Well, so there you go. But uh, but there was a five-year stretch where he was the best player in the game, won an MVP, perennial all-star before he hurt his back. So I, I'm not sure that I buy that, like, being on the Yankees helps you get to the Hall of Fame. Um, being on a good team in general, certainly the more rings you can throw onto your resume – I also look at a guy like like Paul Molitor, Robin Yount, guys like that. Uh, what I think I know Molitor has three thousand hits. Yount, I don't know if he got yep. there. Ra yeah, I Yount. believe I believe Molitor, Yount, and Brett all got to three thousand and are all Hall of Famers. Well, Brett was great, anyways. But those two guys, sure. pe people know George Brett, Robin Yount, Paul Molitor. Not two guys that everyone's like, yeah, I know those guys. Like they're great. George Brett was a great hitter. Those guys I think get forgotten about, but I, I believe. You plug them into New York, they're a Yankee their whole career. It's a little different. I think it depends on how old the people you're talking to are. Um, I would guess a lot of the people who come into your shop have never heard of Paul Molitor or Robin That's Yount. That's a sad thing. <laughs> Anybody who grew up, when I grew up in the 80s, I mean, the number of Paul Molitor and Robin Yount cards that I have in my collection is astounding. They're not worth anything because mm -hmm. that whole era is not worth anything. But, but you know, when they were playing... They were very well-known, respected all-star players. Remember, it's also just a different era. Yeah. You're talking about the 80s. How many players from the 80s have that same sort of magical, you hear their name and you're just like, oh, stud. Griffey, Ricky Henderson. Clemens. Clemens, although Clemens pitched, you know, in the uh, mid to late 2000s, right? I mean, yeah. pitched, Clemens retired in 07. Um, I just think guys who played the bulk of their careers in the 80s, there was no social media. There was no Instagram. There was no, uh, you know, ESPN was pretty new at the, mm -hmm. that time. There was no MLB Network. There, you know, so I just think, especially if you played in Milwaukee um, or Toronto, you weren't getting the national love. And the national love wasn't even a thing as much back then outside of Sports Illustrated, USA Today, yeah. and maybe – Sport magazine or something, you know, sporting news. Life magazine. There had weren't a sports thing there too. weren't a lot of you know, the internet has made everybody Available. a local player, right? Yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, I remember uh, I was probably in high school. I guess I was in college. When Barry Bonds signed with the Giants. Like I knew Barry Bonds was a great player from like playing rotisserie baseball and that kind of thing. I don't think I'd ever seen Barry Bonds play more than five games 
outside of when the Pirates were in the playoffs, because mm-hmm. he was on the Pirates. So I lived in New York. So unless he was playing the Mets or was on, like, a Monday night baseball game, which the Pirates weren't on all that often, you know, or a Sunday night, you didn't see him. So now, if you're a fan of Mike Trout, if you're mm-hmm. a fan of Christian Yelich, if you're a fan of whoever, right? Bobby Witt Jr., you hear this kid's going to be Julio. great. You want to watch Julio or Bobby Witt. They play in Kansas City and Seattle. You can watch them every single night on your phone, on your tablet, on your TV, on your computer, wherever. That wasn't available back then. So baseball was, I think, a much more localized sport in that era. And so because of that, unless you were watching the All-Star game or the postseason, you didn't get the opportunity to see a lot of these guys. So that's why I think outside of the really, really big names – who were on the cover of Sports Mm -hmm. Illustrated all the time, I just don't think any of those guys have that same cachet because they weren't given the stage to to create it. I agree. Derek Jeter is Derek Jeter. Everybody knows Derek Jeter. There's no no way around it. Uh, I've had enough Derek Jeter talk, but I want to ask you (laughs) one more more question. What was, like, what's your best memory of of Jeter? Like, a conversation you had or something you saw him do or just, just whatever, like... Think of Derek Jeter, like man, that like that happened. So, well, I think I'll give you two quick. First, uh, my first year on the beat in '01. At the end of the season, I was brand new. I didn't know anybody. I was MLB.com was sort of a, a new startup, basically, um, and so I, I didn't have any name recognition. Nobody knew who the hell I was. So I showed up every day and worked hard and tried to form relationships. But it's hard. You were competing against guys and that you know other writers in that clubhouse who had been covering this team for five, ten years who were with the Jeters of the world from the time they came up for Big League, so they knew them a lot mm-hmm. better. So that offseason, I went to cover a thing at a hospital in New York. Jeter, uh, as part of his Turn 2 Foundation, was doing a, you know, he brought a guy in Santa Claus outfit to give kids, you know, sick kids some gifts for the holidays and whatever. So uh, he's going from, like, one ward to the next, <clears throat> and he says to the publicist, when do I need to talk to the media? And she said, oh, there is no media here. And he had seen me a couple times, like, in the back of the room. And he goes, what about that guy? And she goes, oh, 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 we'll we'll get you. He goes, give me five minutes. And he just walks over to me, says, come here. We duck into a stairway. He gives me my five-minute interview that I needed, wishes me happy holidays. I go on my way. To me, that showed, A, that he pays attention because... That's awesome. In Yankee Stadium, especially the old Yankee Stadium, there were, like, 50 media people at every game. So I was just a face in the crowd. I had, not, there was, I had not formed any relationship with him or anything like that. But it showed me that he pays attention and that he has respect for people and their time. And I never forgot that because that was one of those things like... That's awesome. He was a huge star. He'd already won four World Series. He'd just been to a fifth. You know, uh, he, was, he was Derek Jeter. Like, he was Derek Jeter already. And he made sure that I got what I needed. So that was one. The other one was the first time I ever took my, my older son to a Yankee game. Um, we got really good seats, actually at the time through my wife's business, not mine. And we were sitting down in legend seats and my son was about four years old. All he wanted to do was meet Derek Jeter. I was like, buddy, I'm going to try. I don't know what I can do. So we were standing in the, towards the front of the legend seats watching BP and Jeter. Had to, I had told him we were going to be there and he's like, I'll come out and say hi. I was like, great. Never shows. I was like, God, my kid's like just bothering. Oh, where's Derek? Where's Derek? So I saw one of the Yankee security guys. I said, hey, can you just tell Derek I'm out here with my son? He's like, I'll let him know. Goes in. About five minutes later, Derek's walking out before the anthem. He looks at me. He goes, you didn't think I was going to forget about you, did you? And I was like, ah, you're busy, you know? He comes over. Every fan is like, Derek, Derek, Derek. He walks right over to me and my son, talks to him for a minute or two. My son was all shy. He's four years old. Gives him a fist bump. One of the Yankees photographers happened to be standing there and took a picture of Jeter fist bumping my kid. That's dope. And it's just, you know, watching... A baseball game through your son's eyes for the first time that he's ever at the stadium was awesome. And the fact that he got to meet his favorite player and that Derek took the time to come over, it was uh, That's dope. That was pretty special. That's awesome. I, I totally agree with uh, him, you know, <clears throat> observing what's around. He pays attention because uh, and, and, you know, appreciates people who take the time to, you know, put their effort into him or something like that. I could see at the event I went to, like, he, like, really enjoyed it. Like, he wanted to engage with people. He wanted to make sure we had a good time. And I think that's, like, really admirable because you don't find a lot of people that really give a shit about. No, you most know, people sure are there to do their thing exactly. and sign their autographs and barely look up at you. 
One of my favorite things in that Jeter documentary were those little vignettes they had on the before they came back in where the kid, a different kid, would come sit in the chair next to him on the field and they would ask him a question. Mm -hmm. I don't think those were so staged. I think he was legitimately getting a kick out of those kids and some of their questions. I agree. You know, I think one of them was like, what's it like to be bald? And I think he, you know, he just, he loves that kind of stuff. And it shows a little bit of the human side of him that you don't get to see in a post-game interview setting. I definitely, he's a great dude. I, I really appreciated my time with him. And he made a couple digs at me a couple more times. And uh, about Detroit. And oh, if stuff. he finds something, he'll dig. Oh yeah, Trust me. yeah, yeah. He, that was awesome. I'm, I'm a USC football fan. He's a Michigan fan, and one year that that he was still playing, USC beat Michigan in the Rose Bowl. So the first day of spring training, I see him. I'm like, hey, did you catch that Rose Bowl? He goes, I'm not talking about old stuff. We're looking ahead to this year. <laughs> so there were always some digs going back and forth. When he when he finds something and he knows it's gonna grate on you a little bit, he'll he'll just keep poking at you. So on top of that event, I did a little recap of to, uh, as to what I got. I should have brought those cards out. But um, other news is Jeter launched uh, the Arena Club. He's one of the, the founders of it with uh, Brian Lee, famous entrepreneur. I'm not really sure what they do, but they were nice <laughs> enough to send me this Derek Jeter signed jersey number. Awesome. Which is, I mean, a <laughs> free cheater. Oh, that's cool. Hey, uh, Bleaker, that'll, that'll look good in the shop. Yeah, Bleaker Trading, X Arena Club, little collab hoodie. Shout out Bleaker Trading. I've hosted a couple events there. But this is pretty cool, and I, I'm definitely going to throw this up on, on the wall somewhere. So definitely check out the Arena Club. I know they do some kind of, like, trading and, and sell sales you on the website. Been, They're grading. Do you have any space left on the walls here? Uh, I'll find something. <laughs> I think i got to take these shirts down. There you and go. I, got, I got a trout I'm putting up there. And Frazier... Didn't fucking bring it today, but he's got a Game Use USA jersey oh, for nice. me. So I'm going to get that frame and put it Sweet. up. Sweet. Go in the New Jersey Hall of Fame over here, I call There you it. go. So that's pretty cool. So well, shout out. Jeter's a New Jersey guy. Yeah, I guess. He was born here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Technically. Technically. You're right. So th this will this will go up there, I guess. But pretty cool. So shout out to them. Check out the Arena Club. Like I said, I don't really know what they do yet, but it was a nice <laughs> enough gesture to shout them out. Um, enough Derek Jeter. No, Still Derek talking Jeter. about the team that I hate, but we, we got to talk about Judge here. Um, man, he's going to break it. Beast. Guaranteed. I mean, pretty much. He might do it before the end of this podcast. You never know. Watching <laughs> guys, Waldo Cabrera, what, we're four batters away. Right. So he's going to break it. Do you think it's the best? If, oh, oh, did he use it home run? Yes, he, he did. He sure did. No, Cabrera, not, it's not home Judge. Run. Right, so not Judge. Because Waldo Cabrera is only about. 57 behind him right now. Wow. Grand slam. Oh, man, I hate the Yankees. That, that was brutal last night. Well, he hit the home run, starts to come back, 9-5, walk off grand slam for Stanton. How, how crazy is that? Well, my, my younger son, who you've met, was very excited because we got a whole bunch of the home run challenge cards from Topps this year. Mm -hmm. We got one Stanton. Last night was the night we put in for him. So he's, we're going to get a, a, one of the limited uh, wow. you know, win cards for, for Stanton's home run challenge. So That's nuts. It's funny because Stanton struck out a couple times around the game. My son was like, man, this was the worst. We picked the wrong night. And then all of a sudden, he walked out of the room before the ninth inning, and Stanton hits the home run. No, he came in. I, I, I said, come in, Judge is up. He sees Judge hit the home run, was all excited that Judge hit 60, and then went back to his room because he's like, well, they're not going to win the game, and I got to see Judge hit his home runs, so I'm done. When Stanton hit the home run, I said, hey, get in here. <laughs> Come here. He came in just as the ball was leaving, and uh, he's like, Dad, we won. He was all excited. So, hey, those home run challenges are not easy to win. You That's pick, awesome. Pick one day on the calendar, and you got to have your this guy hit a home run day. that day. So, Damn. Uh, Judge is awesome. I mean, there's no. He's going to break it. Yeah. Do you think if he does it, well, right now he's leading the Triple Crown. Do you think best offensive season of all time if that happens? All time's tough. This, I mean, you see some of the, the, the seasons that people put up. Bonds with 73, steroids or not. I mean, you still got to hit the ball. My argument with the Bonds thing is there were a lot of players using PEDs back then. Pitchers do. None of them hit 73 home nope. runs, right? I mean, Bonds won seven, six MVPs, seven MVPs, yeah. whatever. The, Clemens won seven Cy Young. I think, I think Bonds won six. six MVPs. Pretty sure. I mean, the guy was a an animal before he ever did anything. Bonds was probably the best baseball player I've ever seen with my own eyes. Um, 233 walks in a year? Yeah. I mean, what was it, 560 on base percentage? Holy I mean, crap. I it's mean, crazy. 
Um, but you look at some other offensive seasons you've seen in the past, you know, some of the Ted Williams seasons and Mantle seasons and obviously Babe Ruth seasons, different game, obviously. Um, I mean, I remember the year A-Rod had an 07 right before he opted right. out, 156 RBIs and, you know. But I think under the context of what Judge is doing, coming into this year, turning down the contract extension, putting that – what would, do you know? Remember what the contract was? Seven for two thirteen point five. So, so it was thirty and a half a year. Cheap. He's going to blow it away. <laughs> this proved to be a good decision for him. Do uh, you think he's the Yankee next year? I do. You do. I do. I, after watching what he's done this year, without Aaron Judge this year, the Yankees are a third place five hundred team, team at maybe. best. The Orioles might be ahead of them. I mean, Judge has carried them on his shoulders. For most of the year, in the beginning Agreed. of the year, the beginning of the year, Rizzo was hitting home runs, Stanton was hitting home runs. Like the team was, you know, Nestor Cortez wasn't giving anything up. The, they had six or six All Stars for a reason. All right, Clay Holmes is the best reliever in baseball for the first half of the year. Since the All Star break, Clay Holmes has been terrible. Awful. Stanton's been hurt. Rizzo's been hurt a couple times. Um, LeMahieu's been out for a while. And the Yankees, I, I understand Carpenter who. I mean, out of if, nowhere. If I had said to you in March, Matt Carpenter, they're going to really miss Matt Carpenter down the stretch. <laughs> you would have been like, wait, he's a Yankee? That would have been weird to begin with. Um, I just think during these last two months, even as the Yankees have struggled and gone through some down times, the games that they've won have been largely thanks to Aaron Judge and what he's been able to do. And so he's the MVP to me. I don't hear about Otani. I love Otani. He's not the MVP this year. Um, I ran away with it. Judge. And I just can't understand – how the Yankees would look at what he's done for them on the field. Forget the rest of it. Forget how many tickets he sells, how many jerseys Church. he sells, the, the, the ratings on the Yes Network for him. Forget all that. Just what he does on the field. Mm -hmm. If you take him off that team, how are you replacing him? I understand he's going to cost a That's lot dead. of money. He's going to cost a lot of money, right? He's worth it. Like I said, the ticket sales, the jersey sales, the Yes Network ratings, all of that stuff combined – Look, they may break even on all of it. It's worth it. What do you think he gets? I think he gets eight years somewhere in the 300-ish range. So about 38 that, or so a year. I, I think, think it's going to be more than Trout. Yeah. Um, it won't break Scherzer's AAV record, but, but Scherzer was a short-term three-year deal. DeGrom may break Scherzer's record. Uh, with a short-term deal this year. Even with the injuries. But I think, uh, you know, for an eight-year deal, that'll take Judge through his age 38 season, um, somewhere between 37 and $40 million. I, I think it's probably somewhere you in gotta the give 300 him to 320 range. So look at look at Miggy, or Pujols at the end. Miggy's hasn't been good in three years. See, granted, he could still hit the ball, but he can't. He hasn't hit for power in three now? years. 30, uh, 39. Okay, so well, actually, he just turned 40. Okay, so... If Judge gets an eight-year deal, his deal expires two years ago for Miggy. It expires four years before Pujols' Angels deal ran up. Right? Pujols was 42, I think. Yep. 41 or 42 when, when his 10-year deal was up. So, Robbie Cano, Pujols, Miggy, those deals were all signed when the guys were 31, 32, and they signed 10-year deals. If Judge gets eight, that takes him through 38, okay, Maybe the last year, maybe two years, aren't going to be 40 home runs. They'll be a -Rod 22 kind of home too. runs. Um, yeah, A-Rod was also, you know, Up there. 40 and, and, and had had hip surgery and had had, you know, a knee problem and, and who knows what his body, you know, was doing without the PEDs. A-Rod was a whole other situation. Plus, A-Rod was a shortstop or third baseman. Pretty grueling position. I mean, Judge... I think ends up, you know, next year, Bader's going to be the center fielder. Judge will go back to right field, um, although he's been pretty good in center. I've been mm. very impressed with his play in center field. Um, I, I just don't know how the Yankees justify letting him go because without him, first of all, I think the fan base will revolt. Mm -hmm. After this season that we've seen, in the conversation for the best offensive season we've ever seen, and you're going to let him walk because of money? The Yankees have money. Money's not an issue for them. I understand Hal Steinbrenner is a prudent businessman and may not want to spend that, but I think it's good business for them to spend that. So, uh, unless Judge doesn't want to come back, I don't. I don't know. I think he. So I've heard a, f a few theories. I've heard one guy who has inside information. Everybody says that, but a former I'm the guy who was. Uh, yeah, of course you do. Uh, an MLB player. I think. I think. 
the camaraderie between you, I don't, obviously I don't know who you get information from, but Emma, a guy who's in the clubhouse, another clubhouse, talks to people. I, sure. I'm sure it's a little it's a little different, obviously. But he goes, he will not be a Yankee next year. And Frazier thinks he'll be a Yankee. I asked him. Oh, I've talked to a handful of people who think he's not going to be a Yankee. People who have... What are the reasons you're hearing? Um, he's mostly, a Cali guy. Mostly that he doesn't want to deal with... New York? The, the whole Yankee New York thing. That he's kind of over it. Um, I don't know that I believe that. I think he understands that... I think he's very much like Jeter in that winning is his priority. And where are you going to go that's going to pay you that money and give you a chance to be in the playoffs every year? The Dodgers aren't paying him. They've got enough. Yeah. You know, they got bets in the outfield already. They've got some other guys out there. There's no reason for them. And they've got their own problems this year coming into the offseason. they got to deal with their rotation. Uh, I, don't, I don't think the Dodgers are going to be in the mix. The teams that seem to be... The ones that get talked about are the Yankees, the Mets, and the Giants. Um, I understand the judges, you know, grew up 100, 100 miles from San Francisco, so it's kind of going home. I think the going home thing is always overrated. First of all, a lot of guys don't want to go home and play at home because that just leads to more people coming out of the woodwork asking for tickets and asking for this. Oh, can you come to my uh, my son's Little League and do a talk or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, secondly, the Giants – even though they won 107 games last year, Awful this, this year's year. been terrible. They have nobody signed. I mean, they got a few guys signed next year. 2024, I think they have like $20 million on the books. So you're basically starting from scratch. So if you sign Aaron Judge, you're doing that with the idea of building around him. Does he want to be in a situation where you're trying to build around mm-hmm. him versus staying at this team that you know is going to spend money? You're going to have a $200 plus million dollar payroll every year. They're going to do what's necessary to try to win every year. If winning is truly the most important thing for him, how do you leave the Yankees if they're willing to give you so, the money? Those are the three th- three teams that you think could potentially be a suitor. Those are the three that I think are any are, other sleepers. It's hard to say if he's really looking at forty million dollars a year or thirty eight. I think million, he gets over forty. There's not. I don't think he gets over forty. I think the the, the cap there is probably eight for three twenty. Is my guess, um, unless it's a sev- unless some team says. We don't want to go eight. We'll give you seven, and you know two ninety four because we just don't want to commit the extra year. So that's forty two. He could get over forty for seven years. If it's eight years, I don't think it's over three twenty. Um, how many teams can pay that? I I think There's a not sleeper that many. is the Angels. They're going to sell the team. They have money, even with Otani. Otani's got one more year. Trout obviously making a ton of money, but they need pitching. But I think, imagine Trout, Otani, Judge. If you sign Aaron Judge if you're the Angels, you are telling your fans, enjoy this last year of Otani because we're not signing him. Otani's going to get some sort of an unbelievable contract. More than Judge is going to get? He's younger, he hits and pitches, and he's a huge attraction. So I don't know if it's going to be more than Judge. It should be... Probably. I went to some Angel games out there. There's no, <laughs> there's no one there. Right, because well, they're terrible. Yeah. But if you know they need pitching and you're going to spend $320 million to bring in another hitter, they have Anthony Rendon. They just spent $250 million on him. Um, I, I just I don't see them. If you sign Judge there, you're basically spending a billion dollars on Trout, Judge, and Rendon, and you still can't pitch. So I, 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 don't, I don't see the Angels as being a factor in this one, I think. If they're going to sign somebody for three hundred twenty million dollars, they'll bring Otani. So, back. what are you, the odds that Judge ends up back in New York? Um, well, two of the three teams that I said were both New York. So, um, with the Yankees, I, I would put it at seventy-five percent. I mean, I, I think it makes sense for both sides as long as the Yankees are willing to pay him what it needs to get paid. They better. Because um, let me tell you, Steve Cohen can pay everybody yep and if he says you know what this will be fun here you go aaron here's uh nine years and 360 the yankees won't match that and could you imagine if the mets steal aaron judge away from the yankees i don't think they will. i would love to see i don't that. think they will because i think they have to pay the grom um and i think or if you let the grom walk I you think... have to replace him the grom taiwan walker 
and Bassett are all free agents after this year. Oh, good Syndergaard back. He's a free agent. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Didn't we just say the Angels couldn't pitch? Wasn't that part of the problem? Well, he's on the Phillies now. Um, I, well, he was on the Angels. Yeah, they yeah. traded him. I, I think the Mets need to – I mean, DeGrom is every bit as popular with the Met fan base as Judge is with the Yankee fan base. I think I go – I and I'm not – and the DeGrom's only going to take three or four years. To but health-wise, though, I I would rather go Judge. I think Judge would be a little more important. Sure. DeGrom's made how many starts the last three years? Not even, a, I think, like 40 starts over three years. Yep. He's going to make about 12 starts this year. Can't count on him. Well, I, don't, I don't feel I, like. Look, the Mets know more about his medical history than any other team. So they're going into this eyes wide open, mm -hmm. right? They know exactly what the MRIs look like. They know what everything looks like. If they believe that whatever the issue was that kept him out for the first half of this year, because it was a different issue than the one that kept him out last year, yeah. if they believe that that issue is not a recurring thing, and they look at how he's been pitch great since he's been back, then I think there's a chance that they uh, they do it. And like I said, he's 34, I think. Yeah. You're not looking at a guy who's going to get eight years. You're looking at a pitcher who's probably going to get four, four or five years, max, right? Four years, maybe with an option. Um, you know, Scherzer got three and 125 or whatever it was. Um, and he's 37 going to 38. So, but I just think, uh, if the Mets are going to spend big like that, unless Steve Cohen just says, you know what, screw it. I'm going to have a $340 million payroll. And I don't care. I'm worth 14 billion. I don't really care what it is. Then, then maybe he just says, you know, throws it all to the wind and says, all right, let's sign everybody. Um, I wouldn't be shocked. That's too. They have a different feel. This year, I really, I really believe that. Yeah, different feel in Queens. Show Walter's been a huge difference to them. I love Buck. Huge difference. He, love a, Buck. As important as Scherzer and Marte, uh, and Canna and and Escobar and all these guys were for them, Buck Show Walter was the most important guy they signed this year because I loved he, him in Baltimore. He's the adult in the room they needed. He's the guy who come in there and say, "Here's how you win, boys. Just follow me." It's either and, him or bring back Terry Collins. <laughs> he was yeah. good. TC is great. Love TC. But uh. We got to talk about cards a little bit here. I want to I wanna get into this, but I'm going to ask you one more question about baseball. Hopefully this doesn't involve the Yankees. Um, World Series this year, who do you think gets there? I think Houston's got to be the favorite in the American I League. Agree. They're really good, as long as Verlander's healthy. And, and the stays Yankees healthy. can never beat them. Yeah. Well, we'll see with the garbage cans not being there, if that makes a difference. Um, Brian Cashman would lead you to believe that it would Still got a pitch. Difference. I agree. Um, we well, still got a hit is the bigger problem. The Yankees in that series in 17, even if the Astros weren't getting the pitches, the Yankees didn't score runs in that series. So yep. you weren't winning that series either way. Um, I think the Astros have to be the favorites as long as Verlander's healthy. He's so good. Framber Valdez, that team is really deep and really well-rounded. Um, so I'd say Houston out of the American League. The National League's going to be a dogfight, man. There are four teams Mets, in the National Dodgers. League. Mets, Dodgers, Braves, Cardinals. You could tell me any one of those teams is going to get to the World Series, and I believe you. Um, the Cardinals have some sort of, like, magic mojo going on right now. Pujols looks like he's 32, not 42. Um, you know, Wainwright's pitching well. He's probably – he's retiring, um, most likely. Yachty's even hitting you know, well lately, Yachty's, too. Yachty's playing you – know, Two MVP candidates. Right. Goldie Arenado. Goldschmidt and Arenado. Goldonado, they call them. As, as good a first and third base combo as there is in the league – Probably the best first and third base combo I've seen since Teixeira and A-Rod in 09. I mean, they're, they are really just special players. Yeah. So the Cardinals are every bit as and, and since, you know, the last two months or so, they've been as good as anybody. Dodgers are so deep. Mets are so deep. Uh, the Braves just, just win, right? Since that bad start in the first two months, they've been playing like 750 ball. I mean, people kept talking about the Mets collapse as the lead kept getting small. The Mets were playing, from the time that the Braves cut that lead down, the Mets were playing the equivalent of 96-win baseball. But the Braves were playing 116-win baseball. It's crazy. So it wasn't that the Mets choked or collapsed. The Braves just never lost. So um, I, I could see any one of those four teams. You put a gun to my head and say, pick one. I'm going to pick the Mets because I think if Scherzer and DeGrom are healthy, can't beat them. how do you beat them in a playoff series? If they're going to pitch three times in a five-game series or four times or maybe even a fifth in a seven-game series, and if Diaz is lights out at the back end of the bullpen, I don't know how you beat that team. I don't know how you score. I think DeGrom's unhittable, usually no matter what. Scherzer, it's just a long ball. Same thing for Verlander. Yeah. Because I've watched both of those guys for a long time, and if they cut down their home runs in half, 
They'd have literally an under two ERA, if Berliner, not lower. Berliner every does year. have an under two ERA. Yeah, but I that's. Think but, I think he's at one seventy eight right now. How great would it be? Game one of the World Series, Max Scherzer versus Justin Verlander. Nice. I know for a Tiger fan that might not be so good, but I mean I'd still you know. love to see it. Well, fun fact here is for great. for a Yankees fan, the Yankees have never beat. Well, first of all, they never beat the Tigers in a playoff series, ever. I know. I was at two of them. Number two. Two, three. 12 and 13 ALS, a, uh, DS and I'll, LS. I'll go further back than that. I was there in 06 yep. when Kenny Rogers shoved it up their rear. A-Rod said he looked like Koufax that night. Um, they beat them in that series, and then uh, and then 12, 12 and, 13. and 13. So, yeah, I mean. I the, watched those till the end. I'm sure. I remember watching Jose Valverde well, striking out A-Rod. The minute Jeter broke his ankle in that 12 series, you, they were done. Yeah. That, that team just looked dead. And when they watched Jeter limp off the field and found out he was broken and he wasn't coming back, that that was a sweep, right? I mean, there was no – the Yankees had no shot in that series without him. The other thing I don't think – the other reason I don't think the Yankees get past the Astros – They've never beat a Verlander-led team in the playoffs either. So, it's a fun fact. I think, look, the Yankees, man, I think they're better. I think the Yankees are the second-best team in the American League. That doesn't mean they're going to get to the ALCS. I mean, there's a chance. I think the way it would fall right now, they would play the winner of the Cleveland-Seattle series, and Houston Oof. would play the winner of the Tampa-Toronto they series. They better hope for Cleveland. I think Seattle could beat them. Although I think Seattle, first year in the playoffs – there will be some jitters, and I don't love their pitching. Key guy, Luis Castillo, Yankee killer. Yeah. Like he pitched against him three three games no, here. I think he let up one run. He kills the Think Yankees. about how different it would be if they'd gotten him instead of Montas. I mean, Castillo's really good. So either one of those teams could beat them. Um, if things switch up and they end up playing the Tampa-Toronto winner, those teams know the Yankees so well. Mm-hmm. You put division teams against each other in the playoffs, throw numbers or everything else out the window – Anything can happen in those series because those teams know each other so well. It's why you look at teams like Tampa, like Boston, used to have so much success against Rivera compared to everybody else Mm -hmm. because they'd seen him so many times. So, you know, by the ninth, 10th, 11th time you face the guy, you at least have a bit of an idea. Practice makes perfect. You know, so I I think the American League is going to be tough, but if you get those four teams in the National League as the final four in the National League, those two series and then the NLCS are going to be just captivating TV. And then got to ask you about my Tigers before I show you what we got here. Um, they hired a Harris. Yep, Scott You're Harris. You were telling me before. Good pickup. Yep. What do you think about that? You know, Scott Harris came up through the, with the Cubs under Theo Epstein, and all those guys who come up under Theo end up becoming really good GMs, Ben Charrington and, Charrington. Uh, you know, guys like that. I, I think, you know, he was there when the Cubs won the World Series. He's been part of a rebuild like that. Um Went to the Giants, was part of that 107-win front office. Uh, really smart guy, understands understands the game, understands the business. Uh, I think I think he's a he's going to be a really good hire for the Tigers, and that's a Tigers team that, as bad as this season's been for you, they got talent. There were a lot of there was a lot of hope coming into this year. There's a lot of good young talent there. Got a great manager, and uh, you know if you take that next step next year, that everybody thought they were going to take this year make it a little bit of an appealing place. I mean, you know, after what they did last year, Javi Baez said, all right, sign me up. Take another step forward. Free agents are going to look. A.J. Hinch is a great recruiter. Uh, I think uh, I think the Tigers have some some brighter days ahead. I was thinking this year was going to be the year, like, they're competing for a playoff series. And think about it. I don't think the, the AL, I don't think that division gets any better next year for the most part. No. The division's what? The division winner's going to have 85, 86 wins this year. Just like the Cardinals who won the World Series 15 years ago. Yeah. I mean, shit. You improve by 15 games, you're winning that division almost. And la- the year before, yeah, they had a lot of hope. After the first se- after the first uh, month of the season, awful month. Winning record in five of the next six or four of the next five months. They need to hope that the young kids who struggled this year, Torkelson, a couple pitchers, learn from what they went through this year and come back with a, a game plan next year on how to get better um torkelson has uh so since he got called back up i've seen him play five games or four games looked amazing in anaheim he was hitting blind drives he had a bomb to dead center saw him in detroit hit a ball i mean shit you, the ball dies in center field you, you got to hit it a mile hit the ball a mile right right against the warning track right at the wall robbed of a not robbed of a three-run home run but right short of it i mean any other park almost that, that's a home run 
What I've seen for him recently, his numbers have gone up a little bit. Hit line drives, hit the ball hard. He was one of the top two or three prospects in the game. Yeah, he was number one. He was number one. I, that's not an accident. The guys who are number one in the game rarely fall on their face. Yeah. They may not become perennial all-stars, but they all become productive big league players. Well, Myers. And, you know, uh, well, Myers was a productive big league player. I mean, Still he, productive somewhat. You know, got paid more than he should have, and because of that, the expectation level went up. But I think, uh, you know, Torkelson's too good to, to flop. I think sometimes you see these guys go through some, you know, some bumps in the road early on, get humbled a little bit, and uh, and then come back and sort of figure it out. And I think that's what you'll see with him. Well, I hope he turns it around. I, I He's turned it around towards the end of the year. I think the Tigers hopefully compete for a playoff spot next year, especially in a division. Sure. Just forget about the wild card. The AL East is just too deep. I mean, look at the Red Sox. The Red, are there. the Red Sox, if they're, they're in hard division, probably maybe win that division. And they're... Not good. But you, they still the Orioles. I'm telling. Oof. I think the Orioles actually might be one of the surprise teams that goes after some free agents this year. Sort of takes that Astros Cubs approach, you know, of the tanking, and then they start to build up, and then they supplement it with a couple of pieces. I think Wouldn't the surprise Orioles me. are what the Tigers thought they were going to be this year. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, sounds about they right. They had all their prospects come up and play pretty well. Tigers did not have that happen. Plus, yeah. shit. I mean, the injuries for the Tigers were awful this year. So. Yeah. Well, I've. As I can attest from the number of Casey Mize cards I have in my house, I can tell you that he's uh, good, man. He's, he was, that was really good. That was disappointing. <laughs> but uh, enough of the the baseball talk. I got a card here that I brought out to Cali for you to get graded. So there you go. Oh, look at that. Give us a tell us how you got that. Oh, I love it. So this is a 1958 Topps Mickey Mantle All Star. I don't know if you can. Yeah, you show him right there. Uh, signed by Mantle. I got it authenticated by PSA. It was not worth actually grading because it probably would have been. I don't know if they have. I don't know if they have negative numbers, but it might have been there. Um, I met Mickey Mantle at his restaurant in uh, 1991, and every time I'd go to his restaurant, I grew up in Manhattan, and every time I'd go to his restaurant, you know, a few times a year, I'd always bring this card and like a baseball in my pocket just in case he was there because I had heard that he hangs out there sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I was there one day. And there he was, sitting at the bar, chatting with a few friends. And I somehow worked up the courage. I think what was I was 16 years old. I worked up the courage to walk over to him. I said, Mr. Mantle, my, my dad's a huge fan of yours, which he was. Uh, you know, he was my dad's favorite player growing up. I said, could you, could you sign this card for me, and could you sign this ball for my dad? He signed them both, shook my hand, talked to him for a minute or two, walked out of there, and I've had this card sitting in a, in a one-touch on my desk nice. uh, for a long time, and I... I've been meaning to get this thing slabbed, and finally, when you told me you were going out to L.A., I said, I'm Got giving it, it to you. My, my biggest fear was putting it in the mail and having the U.S. Postal Service do, you know, something and get it lost, and I just, it was, it was I couldn't quite get the guts out to put it in a mailbox or, or uh or any sort of FedEx envelope. So thank well, you very much for we bringing got that it back. Out there. Appreciate that it. That one's going to go in the collection and pass down to the kids, hopefully. Absolutely. This, is, got, uh, this is not for sale. No, that's dope. It's actually cool because it's in a, in a Sharpie, and he doesn't yeah. have a lot of Sharpie autographs because there's mostly pen and stuff. Right. And you yeah, said what was year was that? 90s? 1991. Yeah, Four years before he died. Yep, 95. He died in the summer of 95. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, well I got one you, more. Uh, yeah, no problem. One more question for you before we hop off here. We, we didn't really get to talk about cards. We're, we're going we're gonna to get you on again and talk about cards. Anytime. But um, I did want to ask you, how did you, uh, as a, a writer around baseball and all that, how did you – start getting into cards was it anything having to do with the pandemic and nothing going on or pretty much so uh, i i was a huge card collector as a kid of course i was one of the few people whose mothers didn't throw all their stuff away nice. but i grew up in the 80s yeah. so it was all worth nothing uh, probably should have thrown the, threw them the away. most the most valuable cards i have left from my childhood i had a couple of kind of reggie jackson rookie and Jackson yeah. henderson rookie some pretty good ones like that i have a couple of Really rare garbage pail kids from 1985. Adam Bomb? I have Adam Bomb. I got one of the sealed boxes. SGC right over here. 6. Um, uh, and uh, and I have, as you know, as I've showed you, I have my 1985 Opichi Macho Man Match. Savage SGC 8. Uh, those are two of, my, sheet. two of my favorite cards. So, um, yeah, I was a big collector as a kid. Just had them all in my basement. And then during the pandemic, when there was no sports and nothing else, I was said, you know what? I'm just sitting home one day, I had nothing to do. It was winter time. So I'm going to go in my basement and break out my cards. My friend who lives in Boston, one of my friends from college, um, had been telling me the cards were making this big comeback, and he was starting to invest and buy all this stuff. I was like, really? Let me see what I have. Maybe something's worth it. So I 
went through all my stuff, pulled out anything I thought might be worth anything. Mm -hmm. Most of it wasn't. Uh, but I pulled out anything I thought might be worth something. Spent a few hours on eBay just doing comps to see what anything was worth. A few things were still worth it. I had never graded a card. I'd never bought a graded card. I didn't know anything about the grading. Um, and I educated myself a little bit. Uh, PSA shut down its uh, submission. March of 2020. The week after I bought a PSA membership. <laughs> I bought a PSA membership uh, and my buddy and I were going to send in like 50 cards and we were like in the process of getting all the, you know, all the uh, card savers and all the rest of it and prepping everything. And then we saw the tweet that said PSA was shutting down. I was like, all right, I Tragic. guess we're not doing that. I called PSA after like a month. I was like, can I have my money back? Because this is ridiculous. And they did give it to me to their credit. Um, ended up doing a lot of SGC grading over the last year or so. I really like their, you know, I know it doesn't have the same value as, as PSA. Vintage. Their turnaround right now is like a week which is amazing compared to how long it takes to get a PSA card back. 30 bucks a card. Uh, you know, you get a 9.5 or a 10, it sells pretty well. Um, so my 14-year-old son, about a year and a half ago, started to get into it also. Yeah, I was going to say, and your so son comes in with you and goes now to the it's, shows. Now it's something that uh, we do together, and it's a lot of fun. He's got a really impressive Curry collection. He just bought himself a Curry Auto. Oh, he got He's it? saving up for about a year and a half. Um, so... He's really into it, you know, I'll buy a hobby box here and there. Mostly we just buy retail stuff and because we, we enjoy ripping and just, mm -hmm. you know, it's fun. sit in the office and, and rip some cards. And, if you know, we, we pulled a, uh, a Julio the 87 SP. Auto, uh, the, that 87 SP Auto yep. from the Series 2, um, which was great, you know. So once in a while you get that thrill of, of, uh, of pulling something like that. You never know. It's fun. So, you know, I pulled a Burrow Black. Prism last year, or his rookie year out of uh, Chronicles that graded it and sold it for a few hundred bucks, you know, Super Bowl week. Um, so, you know, I'm not into the real high-end stuff, mm -hmm. but it's fun. I have a few players that I've... And your kid likes it. ...that I've collected a bunch. And most importantly, my kid likes it, and it's something we can do together. So it's awesome. He, uh, he bugs me about once a week. Dad, why can we go over to Santiago <laughs> store? So you cost me a lot of money sometimes, but, you know, it pays for all uh, this nice stuff. I, I try, man. It's... it's uh, <laughs> try to take care of everyone and i appreciate you guys coming in and of course you coming on the podcast i do want to have you do one more thing just tell everyone where they could find your book and uh give me just a little rundown on it and, and uh, we'll get sure. you on our way so my new book is called the franchise new york yankees uh Ooh. sort of a <laughs> <laughs> sort of a history of the team told through a bunch of different theme uh, thematic chapters one on the captains one on the legends one on the game winners one on the acquisitions the architects, like all the managers, GMs, and owners. A um, bunch of different essays. I talked to most of the people um, who are still alive. Obviously, I couldn't get Ruth Gehrig, DiMaggio, Mantle on the phone. Uh, I just interviewed this card, and he told me everything he needed. Um, but yeah, we, we looked, you know, I looked at the whole history of the team through a bunch of different, you know, there are so many books written about the Yankees that you try to put a little bit of a new spin on it. So breaking it up into the chapters the way I did. Um, and Getting to talk to some of these guys 20, 30, 40 years after their careers with the Yankees, it's interesting to hear sort of their retrospective mm -hmm. take on things. You know, talking to Bucky Dent about his home run or, um, you know, Mattingly about his career in New York and the fact that I think he's the only player who has a number retired that never won a World Series uh, with that team. So it's called the Franchise New York Yankees. You can get it anywhere books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, and... Uh, been, it's got some pretty good reviews so far. I've been pretty happy with it. It came out nice. in June, and go buy it. If you're, if you're a Yankee fan, you'll definitely like it. If you're a baseball fan, you'll probably like it. <laughs> That's uh, it's an honest review right there. Well, uh, Mark, I appreciate you com uh, coming on the podcast, and uh, it's a good conversation. got to get you back on so we can talk a little bit more about cards. We Anytime. Talk, talked a lot about the Yankees and Jeter, my two favorite things. I love talking about cards, <laughs> so I'm, I'm down anytime you want. All right, my man. Thank you. You got and, it. Uh, Episode 9, it's a wrap. Episode 10 coming up soon with Todd Frazier. So uh, stay tuned and uh, see you later.